Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Today we have an exciting passage about a faithful man of God who stood up to an evil enemy. I'm just looking forward to getting into this chapter with you. We're going into 2 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be reading about King Hezekiah of the Southern Kingdom. Now, by way of reminder, yesterday we read about how the Northern Kingdom had rebelled against the Lord and fallen to Assyria in 722 BC. That was in 2 Kings chapter 17. And now, for the remainder of our times in this book of 2 Kings, everything else we're reading from here on out is going to be about the Southern Kingdom. Now, most of our examination of these books, 1 and 2 Kings, has been mostly focusing on the Northern Kingdom and how they have rebelled against the Lord. But we have been looking at only the key chapters of these books, and if we had actually read every chapter, we would have been ping-ponging back and forth between the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. But from here on out, we're going to be talking about just the Southern Kingdom, and we're going to see that although they have some good kings, they still also stumble and will fall to Babylon in 586 BC. But we're not there yet. And so in 2 Kings 18, we are introduced to one of the heroes of the Bible named Hezekiah. Now, hopefully you've already read this chapter, and hopefully you're already beginning to gain some admiration for this bold leader. Hezekiah becomes king in 729 BC. Verse 1 tells us that his reign actually began before the northern kingdom fell to Assyria. He was 25 years old when he became king, and and although the text doesn't say it, we know from other accounts he was co-ruler along with his father Ahaz until about 715 BC. Verse 3 tells us that Hezekiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David had done. And you could see the kinds of things he does in verse 4. Verse 4 says he removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. You just got to love this guy. It's been about two centuries of this Jewish syncretistic false worship, and it finally takes Hezekiah to come on the scene and put an end to it. Now, this, of course, would have been unhappy with the people because Hezekiah is getting rid of all the stuff they loved and all the things that were distracting them from true, pure obedience to the Lord. The high places were ostensibly where people were worshiping the Lord, but they were just making things up for themselves. The sacred pillars were supposedly holy places where people could go to meet God. And Asherah were kind of like that. They were these ceremonial poles, probably carved poles, where people would bring offering to these poles for blessings. Even more, verse 4 tells us Hezekiah destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had made. I mean, this is just incredible. The bron- Moses made this thing. It's centuries old, and he destroys it. Now, hopefully you remember what this is talking about here, because this was one of our key chapters a couple months ago, back in Numbers 21. Now, this was during that time when the Jews were rebelling against the Lord. They were just wandering in the wilderness, and the Lord had sent snakes among the people as judgment for their complaining. But the thing is, if a person was bitten, if they would look at this bronze servant that Moses had made, they would be healed. Now, looking at the bronze servant demonstrated their humility and their repentance and their faith and their trust in the Lord. It had a good reason back then, but the people had corrupted it. You can imagine that whoever had this bronze servant now could charge people money and just say, hey, if you look at this, you'll be healed. Just give me five bucks to do it. And they took this item that God had meant for good, and they worship it instead of the one who gave it. People still do things like this today with religious icons and sacred artifacts. We should be worshiping the Lord alone and not stuff and things. And so Hezekiah comes on him, and he brings in this literal sweeping reforms. I love how verses 5 and 6 describes Hezekiah. In verse 5, it says he trusted in the Lord. That little word in has such a wealth of meaning. It points to the movement of the will. It points to living by faith, not just trusting the Lord, but trusting in the Lord. It's about action and obedience. Likewise, in verse 6, Hezekiah clung to the Lord and did not depart from following him. He kept to the commandments that God had given Moses. Like David, he was not trying to establish his own kingdom by his rules and his laws, He was trying to establish a kingdom ruled by God's laws. And so verse 7 tells us that the Lord was with Hezekiah wherever he went, and so he prospered. Now, what a great beginning to the life of Hezekiah. Then, halfway through verse 7, we see another key point. It says that Hezekiah rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Now, this is a big deal, because remember, his father Ahaz was a vassal of Assyria. And so Hezekiah's reform meant even breaking with the precedent his father had established. Well, this little comment here kicks off one of the most exciting miracles in this stretch of Judah's history. Verse 9 says that four years into Hezekiah's reign, Assyria came up against Samaria and besieged it. Now, that's just reminding us of the northern kingdom's fall, and so it just summarizes what happens in the next few verses. But then in verse 13, it says a new king of Assyria named Sennacherib came against Judah and tried to besiege it as well. 
At first, in verses 14 and 15, Hezekiah attempts to establish peace and pay a tax or this tribute to Sennacherib. This price was so high that Hezekiah had to use the gold from the doors of the temple. Clearly, this is a painful situation. Now, why does Hezekiah do this? Well, the text doesn't say, but we need to remember that his father Ahaz was as vassal of Assyria, and for a while they were co-rulers in Judah, so maybe Hezekiah just starts out trying to keep his dad's policies going. But then, the reality of cutting off the doors and melting down the gold just weighs on him, and decides he's not going to go down that road any further. So either way, this isn't good enough for Sennacherib, and he sends his army to descend upon Jerusalem and lay siege to it. They come to Hezekiah's famous aqueduct and they call out to him. Hezekiah sends some of his officials out to meet with these Assyrian leaders, and one of them is called a Rabshakeh. That's actually a title for an Assyrian commander. And in verse 19, Rabshakeh wonders aloud, why are they so confident? He says in verse 20 that they're acting as though they have strength for war. He asks, on what basis do you do this? He says, verse 20, all you say is we trust our Lord, our God. But why would God help you if Hezekiah has torn down all the high places that were dedicated to him? Don't think God's happy with you, don't you? Guys, don't do that. Come on, guys, let's make a deal. And then he makes a stunning statement in verse 25. He says, Have I now come up without Yahweh's approval against this place to destroy it? Yahweh has said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. And so Rabshika claims that God has actually given him approval to attack Judah. Now, I just dropped in the word Yahweh there because every time it says Lord there, it's actually the the Hebrew word Yahweh. He's using the Lord's name saying, Yahweh gave me permission. No doubt this would have stunned the people of Judah. But we need to remember that not everyone who claims to hear from God actually has heard from him. And there are lots of people who make spiritual claims just to further their own agenda. And that's what this Rapshika is doing here. Well, you can imagine it. at this point, these Jewish officials are concerned. They say, hey, don't, uh, don't speak to us in Hebrew because people hear what you're saying. Speak to us in Aramaic because they don't know it. Well, this only emboldens Rabshakeh even more, and he shouts out to the Jewish men on the wall surrounding Jerusalem. He says, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah tell you to trust in the Lord, saying the Lord will surely deliver us, or the city will not be given to the hands of King Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. And then, paraphrase the next couple of verses, the rapture goes on to say, make your peace with me now, and I will protect you. I'll give you a new place to live. I'm going to have to deport you, so you're going to go someplace else, but you will have plenty of provision. Just don't listen to Hezekiah because he's misleading you. And then he cites various people and various other nations that they've destroyed and how their gods didn't help them. And he's like, hey, none of their gods could deliver them. Why would your God be any different? Oh, this had to be so hard to hear. But in verse 36, they were silent because they were obeying Hezekiah's instruction not to answer whatever the Rapsica would say. And then in verse 37, the Jewish officials returned to Hezekiah with clothes torn in grief. And the chapter ends on this fantastic cliffhanger. Well, this is some exciting stuff, right? I mean, think about it. A massive army has come against Jerusalem, a stronger, more powerful army than even the one that came against the Northern Kingdom. This army has a resume of victory over countless people in the Middle East. They are laying siege to Jerusalem. They're standing on the aqueduct for the water source for the city. They're mocking King Hezekiah. They're claiming the Lord has sent them. They're even saying that the Lord's angry with Hezekiah for daring down the high places. They're saying that if the people would forsake Hezekiah, they'll be spared. And they're saying it's foolish to say, we'll just trust in the Lord. This is an exciting scene, just like where they're throwing down the gauntlet and saying, okay, guys, bring it on. And then chapter ends, and we'll just have to find out how it turns out tomorrow. Well, for now, I'd like to just make a couple comments about this chapter in the life of Hezekiah, because there's some great stuff just in his own life here. First of all, for all the nice things that we say about Hezekiah, we need to recognize that one of Judah's greatest kings is the son of one of Judah's most evil kings. Back in verse 1, it says that Hezekiah is the son of Ahaz. Now, Ahaz was a wicked king, and he practiced all kinds of evil and unholy worship, including child sacrifice. Likewise, Ahaz was a lapdog for Assyria. Perhaps Hezekiah saw the sins of his father, and that fed into his passion for reform. The fact is, ungodly parents do produce godly children, and part of the reason why is because children can can see what their parents are doing and say, I don't want to follow that path, and they follow a new path, one of obedience to the Lord. There may be someone who is listening to this right now who is perhaps young and has less than ideal parents. 
Let me just tell you that you can be faithful to God, and you can establish a godly legacy for your family lineage from this day forward. You could be like Hezekiah, just kind of kicking over the ways of the world, the ways of your family, and say, I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm not going to follow what I was taught. I'm going to follow the Lord. And you could rewrite the history books on your family's legacy. In fact, look at how verse 3 refers to Hezekiah's father. It actually says David was his father. Now, if you're looking for an Ancestry.com kind of like readout of genealogy here, you might be frustrated because David lived almost 300 years earlier than Hezekiah. What's going on here? This is obviously not an error in the text. We have all these kings between David and Hezekiah that the author knows this. This is just a Hebrew way of speaking about ancestry and correlation. You see, Hezekiah is a true, real descendant of David, but David is Hezekiah's father in the sense that David's heart and habits were reflected in Hezekiah's life. Because Hezekiah was listening to David, David was his father even more than Ahaz was. And this is helpful also because as we read through the rest of the Bible, we're going to find genealogical accounts of people who are sometimes listed as sons or fathers of someone that they're not really in direct relationship with. These are not errors. These are just denoting commonality. This is just an example right here of a Hebraism to show us Hezekiah was like David. Therefore, David was his father. And thus, Hezekiah was a man of reform. You know, Judah back at the time was filled with all kinds of outward worship but it was insincere and not actually focused on the Lord. Hezekiah comes on the scene and he clears out all of these systems of false worship. He gets rid of these private sites that were leading to disobedience. He gets rid of these sacred traditions that amounted to idol worship. He got rid of their ungodly allegiances with the Assyrians. No doubt these were painful reforms, but it is clear that God was pleased with Hezekiah's reforms during this time. I think it's time for reform within Christianity. The church has become an institution that disseminates what amounts to spiritual life hacks, where we're just trying to help people to be a better version of themselves. The church is no longer calling people to be rightly aligned with God as their king. In fact, the church has become so aligned with the world that in many ways, we're undiscernible from the world. My hope and my prayer is that the church might return back to the clear teaching of Scripture and see that the message of the Bible is not about life hacks. It's about a divine king who is coming to establish a holy kingdom. He invites the nations to be a part of it. And if we will lay down our rebellion and come to him, he will gladly accept us and give us a place in his kingdom. And even more, he will even pay the debt we owe from our sins so that we can live with him forever. And this whole study through these key chapters is showing us this is the message of the Bible. But you wouldn't know it from many churches. They're they're just talking about all kinds of things that don't really conform to the message of Scripture at all. But when the church stops this... When we return back to what the Bible says, we will see a revival in our land and in our world. And so as we end our time together, let's just pray to the Lord that he might call his churches back to his truth, that we would bring reform to the world, and that this reform would start with us. It's a great prayer for the days we live in. We'll leave it there. I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much for listening. God bless. God bless.